Hello everyone. Welcome to another one of our video sessions on Facebook Live. So I had an interesting week. After last week's production, I got in the car and drove to Cleveland with my husband and my daughter who is moving into a new apartment in Cleveland. And she flew to Kansas and went through all of her stuff in the basement that's been there for a couple of years, her four apartments worth of old furniture and stuff. And we loaded a U-Haul and drove 13 or so hours to Cleveland. So I drove to Cleveland, a road, not drove, road to Cleveland and road back from Cleveland in a week's time. Well, there's a lot of downtime for me and that's a lot of time for me to sit around and not do much. And so I decided to do some hand stitching. Now I know hand stitching is not for everyone, but there is something very relaxing to me and I grew up as a hand stitcher making my Barbie doll clothes and my Jenny doll clothes and I still have them and I, I, I marvel at how pretty good I was at five years old at hand stitching. So it's all coming back to me and I'm enjoying that process and so I decided that I would make a garment on the way and from Cleveland. So, but I have to show you first where it started I guess. Uh, Every summer, the sewing workshop does a workshop at Chateau du Ma in southern France, near Toulouse. And we fly into Toulouse and we usually spend one night there and then we go shopping at a very fabulous fabric store there that sells all of the high-end designer fabrics from Paris and uh, Milan and great, great resources there. And so, um, that's part of our little venture. And then there's one clothing store there that unfortunately is not there anymore. But every year prior to this last summer, I've been there. And for some reason when I'm in France, I think of skirts. Now I don't really wear skirts too much. I don't know why. I just put on a pair of pants most days. But I get in the spirit of skirts when I'm in a foreign country. And so I buy my yearly one skirt. So this is the skirt that I bought a year ago, which is this wonderful crushed linen, and it has these pieced sections of miscellaneous fabric, linen gauze, cotton, who knows what, just bits and pieces of rectangles that have been sewn onto this bottom of this skirt. Well, this has been hanging in my closet for a year, mostly because I wasn't sure what to wear with it. And so I decided to make one of our ETs, E meaning a download. So the ET pattern of ours is a download pattern. So I decided to dig out some white and off-white cotton knit and some pieces and parts of some Alabama Channon School of Making stenciled pieces which I had on hand and I began to sew these pieces together with the seams on the outside using a simple running stitch a quarter of an inch from the raw edges using a little heavier thread than normal, uh, sort of a buttonhole twist type thread in white. So I first made this panel and then I attached it to the remaining part of the ET, again with a seam on the outside. So the shoulder seams using what I call a, f a mock flat fell. Sewed the seam at a quarter of an inch, turned the seam to the inside and then top stitched using hand stitching to complete the seam. So the side seams and then I inserted the sleeves. I did actually do a little bit of gathering stitch in a regular thread across the sleeve head so that I could get a little easing on the sleeve. And then I, I did what's called a cretin stitch for the binding. I'll show you that a little bit closer. Maybe you can see the stitch, maybe not left the edges raw, the bottom and the bottom of the sleeve. And so this is my ET that I think goes pretty well and kind of is in the flavor of the patched skirt. And now I have an ensemble and now I can wear it next summer. <laughs> so that's the ET. But the ET pattern is really one of our just good standard patterns for a t-shirt. And my friend Nancy reminded me this week of the white one that I'd made out of the cotton knit, cotton with a little bit of spandex, and I put a black binding on it uh, just to give it a little 
just a little extra punch to the look. But I like the way the hem is curved. It does flare out just a little bit at the bottom of the uh, hemline. It comes with short sleeves, but of course you can always make a short sleeve longer. And I use cover stitching to finish it. Here's another one. And I got this out this morning and realized this needs to go into the uh, washing machine. It's a little bit dirty, so I, I hope you can't see that. But this is an ET as well. Actually, now that I look at this, this is not an ET. This is a swing tee, but I want to show it to you anyway. <laughs> I think it looks more like a swing tee. Never mind. The idea, though, is that you can take any t-shirt pattern and split it down the front and do an overlapping seam because knits don't ravel. And so this seam allowance on this side, which is the overlapping part, has the seam allowance removed. And then I've marked the seam allowance on the corresponding piece with chalk. I've used a little bit of fusy web to glue this together so that I can just do a top stitch and have a raw edge. I also like a deeper hem on a t-shirt. It gives it a little more quality look. When you go into the really nice stores and look at really expensive t-shirts, they, they tend to have a deeper hem. But this has a cover stitched hem as well. Wide cover stitch on the hem, narrow cover stitch on the sleeve, and I've cover stitched around the neckline as well. And you can see I've even done a little bit of a contrasting color on this uh, t-shirt as well. So, so much for this uh, ET that's the swing tee. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, the other thing that I traveled with to Cleveland were two bags. The boulder bag is one of my favorite bag patterns that we have. This is a downloadable pattern. But this is, this took me to and from for a week to Cleveland. Shoes, clothes, cosmetics, whatever. It has a great opening with a nice exposed zipper. It's lined. And it has a zipper interior pocket. And you can put all kinds of pockets and slots in this bag if you want to. It has a semi-rigid bottom in that there is a piece of plastic mesh on the bottom and then I've covered that with a little bit of foam so it's soft and yet it holds its shape. But what I really like about this bag is you can also carry it like this and make it a little bit smaller but it's an easy bag to pick up by either the short handles or a shoulder bag at, with the long handle. So this is the Boulder bag, B-O-U-L. DER, named for Boulder, Colorado. We have some kits of the Boulder bag. We have, I think, one kit left of this gold embossed metallic, I'm not sure what it is, vinyl sort of thing. And we have a four or five kits of the silver version of it. And the kit comes with the pattern, the straps, the lining, the zippers, everything you need to make this bag. So check that out. We'll, uh, we have, I think, four or five of the silver ones and w only one of the gold one left. The other bag that I took is more of a tote bag. This is what I used as my you know, handbag, so to speak, but it, it, it holds a lot of things. So it held my project for the ET. It held my scissors and thread and all of that. But this is the village bag. It does have a magnetic closure that's hidden. These flat magnets that you don't see hold that shut. Two handles and when you bring them together this is the shape of the bag. It has a really interesting tuck sort of affair at the bottom which gives it some dimension and some uh, width to the bag. So this is the village bag and this uh, is a printed pattern. Full instructions on how to make it, and it includes the tissue pattern of how to cut it out as well. So that's the village bag. So my, between my ET and my boulder bag and my village bag, I was all set for my road trip to and from Cleveland. So today is the day to introduce a new pattern, both in print 
and as a download pattern. And it's called the Marceau T. Now, some of you may remember a few Facebook Lives ago, we asked for a name for this pattern. And we had lots of people who gave us really great names, really interesting names. And it became really hard to uh, decide who was going to win. We were going to give a free printed pattern to the person who, whose name we chose. I am, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I am probably going to mispronounce this person's last name. But the winner of the name, the Marceau T, is Teresa Erdogana. And she will be getting the, uh, the printed version of the pattern. And everyone else who submitted a name will be getting the download pattern uh, at no charge as well. So if you know that you sent in a name, you will be getting that uh, soon, emailed to you. Betsy's going to take care of that in a few days. So thank you, Teresa. We love the name. Um, it, was a, it was a tough choice, but we landed on that and we're really happy with it. I happen to have it on, and I, am in, I was telling Aaron before this started how much I love this garment. It just feels great. It's a little bit cloudy today in Kansas. You can feel that fall is coming. It's a little bit on the cooler side. It's not 120. It's like 80 whatever. So long sleeves, I'm beginning to think long sleeves and beginning to think about moving out of my pure summer clothes. So let me tell you some of the features of the Marceau tee. I have two of them on the back wall. You can tell that we really love stripes and it's a great pattern to use stripes. And because I've, we've used stripes that don't have the same width, you don't have to worry about matching them, which I love. So this is in obviously yellow and the black and white stripe, but it has the seam in the front and a seam in the back, right in the center. And because of that, you can shift these pieces. So it is shift, the left side is shifted down about the width of a hem, about an inch or so. So you have lower on the left-hand side, both at the top and is put on separately, not in the round totally, but right side binding is applied and then the left side binding is applied. That makes it super, super easy to put on. And they are hemmed individually. So the right side is hemmed and then the left side is hemmed. It looks like a simple t-shirt and it is, but there are pattern pieces for all the right sides and all the left sides so that you don't have to think about what is going to be cut out in what color or what stripe. You have a pattern piece for every single piece that you're going to cut out, even the cuffs, even the bindings. So that's really one of the pluses. Uh, the sleeve, though, is one of the more, I think, one of the more interesting aspects to this. It is a two-piece sleeve, so there's an undersleeve which is a fairly narrow little panel. And that means that you, and the upper sleeve is longer, and so it can be tucked, create this fullness and tucks sewn into the undersleeve, which has no tucks. And then on the bottom of that, you have just a simple, nice cuff. So I'm pretty crazy about this. Um, I hope you like it as well. Here it is in a beautiful uh, fuchsia pink stripe with a little bit of a pinstripe to it. And then we have the even stripe in the black and white for both of these. And then I have on uh, the same width, I believe. Actually, they're a little bit different now that I look at it. So I didn't have to match these either. That's right. So but here we go. Red and white, black and white, yellow and white, pink and white. Aqua and white, whatever. Those are the elements of the, uh, the Marceau tee. Now, we happen to like these cotton knits. We have a lot of them, and we have a lot of stripes, and we have a lot of solids as well, but today we're going to concentrate a little bit on the stripes. So here we have the options for the black and white. We have the even stripe, evenly spaced white, evenly spaced black. Then we have predominantly white with a little narrower black. Again, we have a wider stripe, which is really great, uh, even stripe in black and white. This is the same fabric that's been used on this Marceau tee. And the 
the coordinate, which is more white than the pink, but they go really well together. So that would be fun to use as a combination if you don't want to use the black and white. We also have the aqua in a pinstripe and its coordinate as well with the uh, mostly, in this case, off-white and aqua. So those are some beautiful combinations. We have this wonderful denim blue pinstripe in the cotton. We also have a bit left of the red that I've used. Uh, if and when we run out of this particular red, we're going to substitute with a red and white that's this width of stripe. So we'll let you know if you order the red and white and we happen to be out of this, this is what you'll get instead if we happen to run out. So just, just know that. Now, in the, in the spirit of the ET that I made, we also have some cotton knits in white and off-white, and we have the black cotton, and these happen to have a little bit of viscose in them, rayon and spandex. So they have recover properties. You can stretch it, it's gonna go back. We like that. And this is a fun stripe too. This is a red and cream with this very classic sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, it reminds me of something uh, Hampton, uh, beachy, I shouldn't say beach exactly where, but what, what is this, sailor-like or sure. something like that. Yeah. So hourglass. it looks like little hourglasses. Yeah, nice little pattern on that stripe. So all of these that I've mentioned are going to be on sale starting today for another week. And we'll tell you about what those specials are in a minute. So what do you wear with this Marceau tee? Well, I happen to have on my Picasso pants in the black cotton and lycra that I have talked about more than once. And it still is one of my favorite fabrics. I have worn these pants and worn these pants. And I'm telling you, the fact that it has a little bit of lycra in it makes it even more comfortable. And there's a little bit of a sheen to this fabric, which I like very much. So it's not just a flat black. It's a very comfortable fabric, very serviceable. Wash is great, dry cleans if you're a dry clean person. So that's one of my favorites. But you can also make the Picasso pants in a knit. And this happens to be the lightweight version of Ponte knit. Now Ponte knit has a tendency to be a little bit stiff. And so I generally think of regular Ponte as for pants that have more structure to them. But when you want the flow and drape, but you like what Ponte uh, brings to the table, which is that it doesn't ravel, it's super uh, uh, structured and still easy to sew. Think about the lightweight Ponte, and we have the black and we have other colors as well, but you get the drape and flow, but yet the properties of a knit for the Picasso pants. Another pattern that I like and looks great, I think there might be a photograph of me somewhere along the line uh, with this garment on and this pair of pants, actually. This is the getaway jeans, our jeans pants pattern. It has a traditional fly. I think that our technique on how to do this fly front is the best that you will ever find. And we took that technique. I think I uh, credited Sandra Betsina for this a long time ago uh, when we were talking about it. It's still one of my favorite techniques. So it has a flat band in the front, but some elastic in the back attached to a yoke. So you have some fitting opportunities there. Nice pocket. I love the fact that this turns up. That's part of its feature. And you can bind the seam, give it a little bit of a kick, add some color, some pattern and coordinate it if you want to. I'm gonna do a Facebook Live in the future on how to top stitch on the getaway jeans. We also have the hardware, the right snaps uh, for the getaway jeans as well. So anyway, I think the getaway is a really good possibility to wear. And then Aaron made the West End pants. This is actually in a very, very narrow corduroy, just a pin whale corduroy. So the, we think of the West, West End pants as just being versatile with almost any kind of fabric. Here it's a little stiffer, but the profile is still great with this particular Marceau tee. It has a nice pockets, elastic waist. So think about the West Ends as companions. 
All right, let's talk about cover stitching just a little bit. So if you're not really familiar with cover stitching, um, you, all you have to do is go to your closet and look at any knit garment that you've purchased in the last 20 years, and you'll see that there are rows of top stitching on the right side of your garment, and then on the back side you have some connecting loopy stitches. For a long time, we as home sewers couldn't replicate that stitch, but for a long time now, we have been able to do that using a cover stitch stitch. So you have options of using two rows, which is a three thread stitch. So you have two threads on the top, one on the bottom. So that would be a three thread. You can adjust it so that it's either narrow or wider. Or you can do three thread on top, one on the bottom. That means four thread cover stitching. And we sometimes call this a triple cover stitch. So on the top of your garment, this is basically what you're going to see. Straight stitches. It's as if you've stitched two rows of stitching on your sewing machine or you've used a twin needle or something like that. But here's what it looks like on the back. So when you've turned the hem over, then this is a stitch. This is what this stitch right here looks like on the back side. This is what I'm talking about with this connecting stitch. The purpose of a cover stitch is you want to catch the raw edge on the wrong side. I've seen a lot of videos and classes where people are stitching and making it look great on the right side of the garment and they're forgetting that you want to cover that raw edge on the inside as well. So that takes a little bit of practice. As with all of our hems on knits, you want to first press your hem in place and you want to use some fusy web to, quote, glue it down. This is a paper covered line of glue. We call it fusy web. So it's this little bit of web. Whoops, just dropped it. Saw it there, hopefully. Here we go. So when, when you have fused this line of paper down and you take the paper off, you have this very sheer web of glue that is so sheer, you never see a ridge. This is the finest product of its kind on the market. You won't find anything this sheer. So check that out. We carry that product. It's been a good old standard product for us for a long time. So you would apply that to the, raw, the wrong side of the raw edge of your hem. You would turn your hem and press it in place. And that's in preparation for hemming with your cover stitching. Now, I do a lot of practice stitching uh, before I really go to my garment. So I'm making some samples, several samples, pre-pressed, pre-glued, and I've either marked my stitching line with chalk on the right side of the fabric so that I know exactly where to place the presser foot. And by the way, I use a clear presser foot for all of my serging, basically, uh, especially on cover stitching. I really like that. Or I'll use some painter's tape on the throat plate of the, serge, the uh, cover stitch machine, and that I will line up my raw, or excuse me, my folded edge with that. So either way, you've got to practice and make sure that you are stitching exactly in the right place to, to cover that raw edge. It might be easier for you to start using a wide stitch or even a triple stitch before you go to the narrow, because obviously it takes a little more precision to sew with the two thread narrow than it does with the, th the two thread wide or the triple stitch. So practice. I have a class on Craftsy called Serger and Cover Stitch Fashion Details. And the idea of that class is that I cover a lot of, of details about how to cover stitch using it in fashion. I mean, it's one thing to go to your dealer and practice some cover stitching on a piece of cotton. It's quite another thing to actually perform it on knits and shears and laces and open weave things. And so when you go to your dealer, uh, whatever brand you're selecting, you want to take the kinds of fabrics that you are going to be using and 
let them demonstrate or you actually practice on the machines in the store. Because it's the, the machines in the stores are always set for perfect on cotton, but you want to make sure that you that machine will perform for your kind of fabric that you're using. But this Craftsy class, for those of you who still have it, you will be getting it again. For those of you who don't have it, you will be able to purchase it again sometime in September. I need to listen to the town hall uh, episode for the instructors on Craftsy uh, in order to tell you a little bit more about how that's going to happen, but I just haven't had a chance to do that yet. But it s sounds to me like it's going to be reverted back to Craftsy rather than Blueprint. I think they'll use the combination of the two words for a while, but I think we're going to be able to finally say Craftsy again. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. So check out that class on Craftsy. All right, um, let's talk about uh, sort of dedicated machines versus combination machines for cover stitching. I resisted the whole cover stitch process for a long time. For, for whatever reason, I thought it was only on cheap clothes, but I was so wrong. It is on every level of price of clothing, from very inexpensive to very high end. So if you are a serious garment sewer and you're thinking about upgrading your equipment, I, I think that a cover stitch capability is something to add to your repertoire of machinery, probably before you even upgrade your sewing machine, if your sewing machine is behaving beautifully. So you can buy a dedicated machine, which only will do the cover stitch or, or chain stitching. Those are the same threading processes. Or you can buy a combination machine, which will overlock, or it will cover stitch and chain stitch. That's two different threading systems. And so it requires a little bit of change on a combination machine of some settings, some threading, perhaps another uh, uh, throat plate sort of affair. Every machine is a little bit different. So when you go to your dealer, you're going to want to see how that's changed, how those pieces and parts are changed or the settings are changed before you walk out of the store. Don't do what I did. Go into a dealership, buy a cover stitch machine, and leave in the box. Uh, you want your dealer to teach you how to make those changes so that it's an easy transition. But I don't know about you, but I have more than one machine. So I have a dedicated, in fact, I have two dedicated cover stitch machines, and I have one combination machine. I have a Bernina dedicated machine that does a great stitch. Bernina is coming out with a brand new combination machine that you can pre-order now, and the number on that is an L890. The nice thing about that is going to be it's air threading. It's got all the bells and whistles. It's going to be the top of the line, do everything, combo, overlock, cover stitch, chain stitch machine. And you can probably see one in your dealer now. You're not going to be able to walk home with it in a box, but in a a, a little while, you're going to be able to uh, get your hands on it. But you can at least pre-order it and pay, put your money down. So I'm looking forward to that. But in the meantime, my Bernina dedicated only machine is top notch and does a really great looking stitch. I also own a baby lock combination machine, which does a very nice cover stitch machine and it is easy to thread. It does have the air threading, which the Bernina is going to have. But right now, I believe that the baby lock is the only air threading uh, machine on the market. The, the threading is super easy and the cover stitch looks great. Unfortunately for that machine, which can also overlock, I use it 99% of the time for cover stitching only, so it's a little bit of a waste for me. I like the ability of having things set up ready to go, but that's a decision that you can make uh, when you, after you visit with your dealer. Uh, I also own a Janome which is a, a nice machine. Uh, it's very inexpensive, it's really affordable, and Bernina has a Burnett, which the number on that is a B42. So the Burnett B42 and the Janome machine are dedicated cover stitch machines, and they are in a price range where you, if you're wanting to tiptoe into cover stitching and don't want to spend a lot of money, I recommend look, uh, looking at the Burnett or the Janome. So check out those machines and decide whether you want a dedicated machine or a combination machine.
All right, I think that that about covers it. There are uh, some things to remind you. If you want to know more about cover stitching and sewing knits in general, this is my book, Sewing Knits from Fit to Finish, that I hope you will check out. And if you order it from us, obviously you get it uh, signed by me. You can also get it, I think, on Amazon and other booksellers as well. One of the fabrics, well, I'll come back to that. So I think that I've talked, have I talked about everything, Erin? I think you should come around here, though, because Erin has on a really cool-looking ET today that is a combination of stripes on the sleeve and the neck and this beautiful print in the body of it. And she's wearing it with the West End pants, which I think are the great pants with either the ET or the Marceau tee as well. So she looks great in that. All right. So, do we have any questions? Um, I know that um, they wanted to see the um, technical for the Marceau up close. If you, yeah. All right. Here's the technical. Someone wanted to see the technical on the Marceau. Mm -hmm. There we go. Kind of shows that sleeve detail. So, remember, this is either a print pattern or a download pattern. Your choice. Someone wanted to see the red stripe up close. So it's a pinstripe red on cream. Is this too close, Erin, or is this good? That's good. Okay, and now you can see the little um, hourglass shapes on it. It reminds me of Tommy Hilfiger. That's what I was trying to think of. And he does those ads with the boating scenes. So there you go, boating. <laughs> yeah, polo, there you go. Right. This red that I'm wearing is, someone wants to know whether this is a cool red or a warm red. I would say this is a cool red. This is like red. This is crayon, Crayola red. I, I don't think of, although I say that and I'm wearing it, and it's, I don't normally wear red. I wear more orange red, so I don't know. Maybe it looks good on me, maybe it doesn't, but it's kind of that middle. Yeah, it's a good for everyone red. There you go. Uh, do you have any tips on the stenciling for the Alabama Channon? Do I have any tips on stenciling for Alabama Channon? Yes, I do. Um, I've done a bit of this on my own. And I went to my local hobby store and I bought some Martha Stewart uh, acrylic paint and a dauber. And I actually cut out my own stencils. Uh, there, you can buy a, a foam, I don't know what the name of it is really, a stencil product, but I used a utility knife to cut out some shapes and then I kind of lightly spray glued the uh, material to the knit and then daubed it uh, with my dauber. You could use a paintbrush, you could probably buy a little bit of a sprayer. You know, I own the whole kaboom with the sprayer and the compressor and the paint and all of that. But if you're just doing small bits, then you can do that by hand with a dauber. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to get it too thick. That was my first error. Um, you can tell if it's too thick, then the fabric gets kind of stiff and that's not what you want. All of the knits, every single one of them are 60, 60 inches wide. They are cotton, 95% cotton and 5% spandex. They are also Ecotex, which means they are sustainable, which is nice. The, th the white, the off-white, and the black are... 60 inches wide, 60% cotton, 40% modal, which is rayon. It has a little different feel, but it has a cotton look to it. I was surprised that it had the modal in it, actually, when I felt it, because it feels like the cotton. They feel just the same. So. Um, when you 
make the Picasso pants in a knit, would you go down a size? When I make the Picasso pants in a knit, do you go down a size? No, I use the same size. Um, when you're talking about the jeans, how did you bind the seams? When I'm talking about the jeans, how did I bind the seams? I've done it two ways. First of all, I've used prepackaged binding when I've, I've already surged the seam and it's, it's uh, surged together. Then I can just use prepackaged binding and uh, literally wrap the seam and top stitch it on. And it's only done for about, oh, seven inches, I think is the number in the. Um, so it's only done for a portion of the seam like seven inches or something like that. You don't do the whole seam. So it's super easy. Or you can make your own binding using one of the little bias binding makers or make your own binding by folding it in half and then folding the raw edges to the center fold and just simply wrapping the seam. There's what it looks like. Um, what kind of thread do you use for knits? What kind of thread do I use for knits? I always use polyester thread for knits. You have the strength of the polyester and a little bit of give, which is what you want when you're sewing something that's stretchy. I use cotton thread for everything else and polyester thread for knits. Um, when you're working with a cover stitch machine and you get all the way around on a neckline, like how do you finish that in the round? When I'm using cover stitch and I'm doing a neckline and sewing in the round, all right, so I usually start uh, at the center back or near the center back. And I, when I'm coming around, I'm, I'm sewing over the previous start of the stitching by about three quarters of an inch or a half an inch, something like that. And then I take the flywheel and I'm bringing it completely forward so that the needle is completely down in and then bring it up to the top. I raise the presser foot. I take something like a seam gauge and pull out the two top threads or the three top threads so I have a loop out here. I cut off the loop and then I hold where the stitching is left off and I pull it to the back and that pulls out the under thread and then I thread each end of each thread with a needle with a large eye, take those threads down to the wrong side and I tie knots. I know there are other ways to do it like yanking it and all that. But that is the cleanest way that you can do it, I think, and not have a little bit of, uh, of a pull uh, or a bubble or a tunnel at, the, at that point of connection. That, that is usually, <clears throat> excuse me, in the directions. I know it's in the Bernina directions of how to do that when you buy the machine. I can't speak for other brands, but that is, um, that's how to do it. And, uh, that's also in my craftsy class where I do it live and you can, not live live, but uh, on camera, on a video and you can see, see how it works. But that is something you need to practice and perfect. And that's why that clear presser foot comes in handy because you can see exactly where to stitch over the previous stitches, which is important. What model is my dedicated cover stitch machine? Um, I th it's a Bernina. I think it's an L a 410. It's right around the corner there. You want to go check it? Uh, it's set up. For We're going to find out here what brand it is. Um, Bernina no longer makes this particular one, but you might be able to find it at a dealer who might still have one. Uh, but they have, Bernina has put all their eggs in this new combo uh, configuration, and yet, and then they have the Burnett one, the, uh, what did I say, a, a, a B42. An L220 is the dedicated Bernina machine that I have. L220, and I'm, I'm crazy about it. It is, it is a perfect stitch, it is reliable, and I've enjoyed using that machine. Can you make the Picassos or the West Ends full length? Uh, I think the answer is yes, you can. But I think that the Picassos lose their edge when you make them full length. When that taper 
is at the, at the floor, there's something wrong with the proportions on that. So I suggest if you're needing or wanting full length pants, eliminate the Picasso. But the West Ends look great floor length. Uh, my daughter, who's tall, has a pair that literally brush the floor in a real flowy fabric and they're beautiful. So yes, you can make th those pants any length that you want. And there are lengthened and shortened lines on the pattern. Marceau tee only meant for stripes. I'm That's sorry, say that again? Um, can you make the Marceau in something other than stripes? Oh, yes. <laughs> can you make the Marceau, Marceau tee in something other than stripes? Absolutely. It can be one knit fabric, same color. It could be color blocked. It could be two tones of red, uh, a gray, a black. Uh, I'm going to be making it soon out of our new French terries. I'm sure I'll show you that in the future. We have a lot of fabulous colors of French terry. I think that's the perfect fabric for it. Um, obviously, we have the pattern is so new that we haven't um, made it up in a lot of different fabrics yet, and we do love stripes around here, as you know. Uh, but no, you can make it in, in any... It does need to be in a knit fabric as far as I know. Uh, we have not made it in a woven. I probably won't even try at this point. There will be somebody who will and they'll love it and will know about it and so we'll get to tell you that. But right now it's for knits only. I can see it in a ponte knit, a lightweight ponte knit, French terries, jersey knits, overlock knits, laces. I don't think there's going to be a limit to what kind of knit fabric you can use for this other than I feel like it needs a little bit of structure, so these super, super tissue weight knits, I'm not sure about that. I'm going to have to see that happen before I, I say it's for real. And how does it fit compared to the swing tee and what size are you wearing? How does it fit compared to the swing tee and what size am I wearing? I'm wearing a small, and I, that's the same size I wear in the swing tee. I will say this, the swing tee has a little narrower shoulder. And sometimes I will widen the shoulder on the swing tee, but I am wearing a straight small. And I, I haven't checked how much ease I have in this, but I have a fair amount of ease. I, I bet I have, I probably have 10 inches of ease in the hip and maybe six or so inches of ease in the bust. So it's, it's meant to be loose. Uh, I wear my clothes perhaps a little bit bigger than some people do, but um, I like the way this feels and fits. So small, I'm pretty much a small in all of our t-shirts. The ET, the swing tee, the Marceau tee, the urban tee. It's pretty standard. Um, a lot of good comments about the Boulder bags and they want a Boulder bag or a bag Facebook. Oh, I've been thinking about a bag Facebook. Yeah, we're probably going to do that. Good idea. We have a lot of great webbings and, and zippers and findings for bags. I'm, I'm into that. So we'll do a bag Facebook Live one of these days. Okay. Um, what is the bust size built into your pattern? What is the bust size built into our patterns? Um, that is not a question that we can answer easily. Every pattern is different. Um, we, we have measurements on the back of our envelopes that are the body size. And then when you measure the pattern, you can compare. So if, if a small is one number for body and another number for the actual pattern, now you know how much ease we have built into that pattern. So every pattern is different. Okay. Uh, and again, can you, what is the pants fabric you have? The pants fabric that I have on is the, it's black, cotton, and lycra. And it has a little bit of a sateen finish to it. We have it in black and we have it in navy and we have it in a Bordeaux burgundy, all of which are the same fabric. And last question, um, how does the stencil fabric wash up? How does the stencil fabric wash up? Beautifully. There's no, I can't see a change in any of this. I have several skirts and tops, a couple jackets in the stenciled School of Making Alabama Channon fabric and they've been washed and they look just as good as the day they were done. I think it depends on uh, what kind of paint you use and how, how much it's applied and so you may want to do a little test, wash it a couple times, see what happens. It's bound to fade a little bit and maybe you just don't notice it over time, but I would test it for sure if you're doing it at home, uh, see what happens. So one thing uh, before we go, Did we mention all the right, two things, three things actually. <laughs>
All right. Um, so if you purchase more than $100 in the next week, we will send you a free village bag pattern. Instructions and the tissue pattern are in here. So over $100, free village bag pattern. Uh, we have, uh, we're starting our dress workshop with Samantha on uh, Wednesday, this, uh, next Wednesday, a week from tomorrow. And so next week we're going to be talking about dresses and some details that Samantha is going to bring with her dresses. But right after that we have a two-day class called a MOLA t-shirt. So here is the ET swing tee. Uh, again, we sort of copied the idea from the Marceau of doing a solid on one side. This is the wide stripe on the other side. And this is a little bit of a MOLA. These are the the wonderful hand-stitched, hand-appliqued pieces from artisans, mostly in Panama, Colombia, uh, countries like that. And so we have a lot of molas on hand for people to use, and they're going to be able to apply these appliques to their any t-shirt pattern that we have, basically the ET, the swing tee, the Marceau tee, the urban tee, or whatever. So this class is a two-day class coming up a week from Saturday and Sunday. So we're beginning our workshop starting next week back in Topeka. We've done our social distancing with our sewing space. We've opened up some walls so we have good space for shopping. So we hope to uh, see a lot of you in Topeka in the next few months. All right, now we have some specials. So the village bag pattern, if you buy it, is $12 or free if you spend over $100. The boulder bag pattern, which is a download, which means you need to, to purchase things through your account. You need to sign into either an existing account or set up a new account so that when you purchase something that's a download, it automatically goes into your account. So the boulder bag, is $12. The ET download pattern is $12. The Marceau printed pattern is $18. The Marceau digital pattern is $15. All of the fabrics that are on the wall here, the stripes and the solids, are 15% off. The Boulder Bag kits are 20% off. We have two tutorials that you might want to check out relating to how to sew on knits. Sewing Fashion Knits and ET Evolution. This ET Evolution tutorial is all about how you can make some really fun changes to the ET pattern. Several details and alterations to the pattern to make this um, a fun pattern. Um, Remember that you might want to check out the sewing knits from Fit to Fashion, Fit to Finish, and the Fusey Web. And also, I didn't hold this up earlier, but we do have the yellow stripe as well that's on sale at 15% off. I just couldn't do anything with this because it doesn't have a core, so kind of awkward to handle. All right, so hope to see you next week. Thank you so much.